You're listening to Life of the Record, classic albums told by the people who made them. My name is Dan Nordheim. Van Dyke Parks was born in Hattiesburg, Mississippi in 1943. After growing up studying music and working as a child actor, he moved to Los Angeles, California. He began performing in folk groups around town and ended up arranging the bare necessities for Disney's The Jungle Book. He recorded singles for MGM Records and worked as a session musician for producer Terry Melcher, who later introduced him to Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. Parks was hired as a lyricist for the Beach Boys' Smile album, but became disillusioned with the project and left in 1967. Producer Lenny Warnker then signed Parks to a contract with Warner Brothers as they embarked on recording a full-length album. Song Cycle was eventually released in 1968. In this episode, for the 55th anniversary, Van Dyke Parks and Richard Henderson, author of the 33 and a third book Song Cycle, reflect on how the album came together. This is The Making of Song Cycle. Hello, this is Van Dyke Parks, and I'm here on Dan Nordheim's wonderful podcast and uh, give you all the scoop about the making of Song Cycle over 55 years ago. So I think about the past. It's nice that we think about uh, about 55 year span since the release of my first album. It's good. But uh, I am happy with it. I know I did my best. I unfortunately didn't know why I was doing the album beyond the practicability of learning anything. I didn't want to be approved of or screamed at in a concert. That just was not my thing. I wanted to find what was going on in this incredibly developing technology that offered such studio wonders. Recorded music was coming of age, a golden age of analog. So I staggered around Hollywood for a while in the early 60s, and in 1963, I got my first contract. That was at MGM Records. The first person to call me an artist was Tom Wilson. I was very uncomfortable with that word. I simply was fascinated by the studio, and I decided that this would be a great way for me to get into a studio, go ahead and call myself an artist. So I did that, and uh, I was very happy to have the two... um, singles on MGM. I saw Steve Stills recently. Hadn't seen him in 50 years in his arc of achievement. And uh, he was in my band at that time. And we opened for The Loving Spoonful. And there was uh, the, uh, The Mothers of Invention, in which I played a small part. But then I started busying myself. I busied myself by being a studio musician. I could play written notes on the guitar. I could play guitar lines or um, or I could play the piano because I'd gone to school to learn how to play piano, play piano or clarinet. I'd play clarinet when my feet didn't touch the ground. I've studied music. It's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in the entirety. There's nothing privileged about a discipline in music. 
It's a life of sacrifice. You learn that. And you learn that with every contract that's thrown at you. And so I avoided contracts for a while. It was a smart move. Uh, actually, I was only 20 when I signed my MGM contract, and that's not legal or tender. But I had fun doing it. I learned a lot, and I learned about the positioning of microphones in recording. That became very important to me. All of a sudden, having listened to the music of uh, Les Paul or Mary Ford or Spike Jones, for that matter, and many other pioneers in electronica with acoustic sounds, this would be my fascination. Recorded music was different from live music. Suppose you have a mandolin and then a wall of brass. Well, darn it, the brass might engulf the mandolin. So by repositioning the microphones, which was taboo for some time, uh, we found an entirely new opportunity in the point of view that recorded music can offer an assembly of musicians. So that gave me a lot of understanding. But I, I was a fixture in town, and so uh, producer Terry Melcher started using me as a studio musician, as well as Rye, a cooter, and we were regulars in that, in that group. It paid the rent, which is a, really a feat in Los Angeles County, still is. And um, Terry Melcher produced some great rock and roll records. If you like rock and roll, he produced some rock and roll records, and we presented ourselves as Paul Revere and the Raiders, me and Rye and some other studio musicians. It was common to have musicians play for you. And um, I played for the Birds on uh, 5T. And then that work with Terry Melcher led to uh, being introduced to Brian Wilson and uh, being cast as a uh, lyricist with Brian Wilson, which shocked me, actually, because... My aims were musical. I'm a dweeb. I'm sorry to say it. I don't give a damn about the other stuff. I'm not even interested in how the truck blew up. I'm not interested in, so interested in being in love or having lost my love or my truck or anything like that that pertains to the topicality of most songs. And I think the reason that I got the job with Brian Wilson was that I had been playing as a musician in Brian's works in the studio and there came a time to arrange good vibrations to get it done so we could so that I could get more involved because I wasn't really involved with good vibrations I had been on the floor in the in the middle of good vibrations on a pedal holding the the pedals down with my hands because it was easier to manipulate the foot pedals with my hands than with my stocking feet. In the middle of good vibrations, you'll hear a very low organ sustain pedal tone. That's me on the floor. Then I suggested the cello to Brian because I wanted to see if I could get involved with a little more fancy music. We're going to get fancy here. We're going to do you know, get some strings in here and, and that aren't in the group that he's working with. And I was less mindful of the Beach Boys, so I was interested in Brian Wilson's development and my own. So why don't we try a cello? So he says, great. I get to the studio and there's a cellist and there's a music stand and his name was Jesse Ehrlich. And he was uh, sitting there with no music on the music stand and rather perplexed. And I was in the control room with Brian Wilson, and I had assumed that Brian was going to write some notes for him. Those notes weren't there. So we went to the chorus, and I said to Brian, have him play eighth note triplets, seco, dry, dry as a bone, the fundamental of the chord, eighth note, da 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 And as a result, got the ruby slippers moment of the song. I did that by my power of observation. I was there lucky enough to be in the room with this gent. And uh, I said, Arco. Brian went on talk back. He said, Jesse Van Dyke says Barco. Jesse looked at Brian through the control room window. And he said, Barco? 
I said, tell him with a bow, Brian. So, Arco, it was. So I got myself a, a job as a lyricist because of that. Brian was busy being a musician, a genius. So it was time to put the lyrics on the words, and I did that. And I did it, I would say, w without apology, I did a darn good job. So I did my best. I know that. And that is enough for me. I'm Richard Henderson. I'm film music editor and radio broadcaster who wrote the book 33 and a Third Song Cycle for Bloomsbury's 33 and a Third series of books about individual albums. Van Dyke, as you know, is from the get-go one of the most eloquent people you'll ever meet in an almost Rococo fashion. And he's just a great raconteur. And so Brian picked up on this and said, uh, you know, this is the guy that I want to have do the lyrics for this big project I have in mind, this, this Smile Project. And Van Dyke watched this thing come apart at the seams. He had a front row seat for it to the extent that he left the project. And then he had to be talked into coming back to the project. And, you know, Brian would cancel sessions because somebody's girlfriend in the lobby was a witch and, like, just really goofy crap. Brian had discovered the big world of better living through chemistry. And to the extent that it wound up fouling up the project, he was just, you know, just chasing his first high all through that. But Van Dyke was, was very together. He was, you know, he'd been a pro since he was a kid. You know, he'd been in Amalfi and the Night Visitors on Broadway. He'd been... Uh, a semi-regular cast member in The Honeymooners on TV. He'd been in a movie with Grace Kelly when he was in short pants. I mean, he was like, he'd been in the business. He knew what it was to function in a business-like way. And clearly these sessions were not being conducted in a business-like way. You know, it was, it was just like, okay, now we're going to bring a horse in the studio, and now we're going to set a fire in a pail in the studio. And uh, it just... It just got weirder and weirder. And also, there was all this pressure from the other guys in the band who just wanted to keep making hit records. And this was not an obvious way to make a hit record. Pet Sounds hadn't yielded big hits. It wasn't like the kind of impact that their surfing and hot rod music had. So this is the life these guys are used to, and here's this new thing that's going to undermine it. They don't want that, and they certainly don't understand it. Columnated Ruins Domino... What does that mean to people who barely understand surfing? Like only Dennis surfed. And, uh, you know, the rest of them, just what the hell, you're messing. And like Mike Love's famous quote, don't fuck with the formula. And Van Dyke just couldn't take it. Having spent that stuff with Smile and it's unacceptable to the Beach Boys, etc., and create all the controversy because the lyrics all sat on a, on a note and those notes were different. Those weren't Barbara Ann notes. They weren't Caroline No notes. They weren't I'm Just a Cork on the Ocean notes, which is by one of the great signature lyrics of Brian Wilson himself. Very good lyricist. So I was happy, in a way relieved, to be out of my job as lyricist. And all of a sudden, and then it was time to do an album. And that came through Lenny Warnker having listened to the first song I wrote is called High Coin. When times and places effervesce in words of wonder from down under, I'm no less. I'm fine. It's my time. That was my first lyric. He was absolutely obsessed about High Coin. So he had a fledgling career as an A&R man at Warner Brothers. And I had just been taught everything that Brian Wilson could teach me. And Lenny knew that. But I wasn't signed to a contract. I just did a record with Lenny. One record. It was called Donovan's Colors. But I didn't want to use my name because I really thought I was still reeling from Kennedy's assassination and had a certain reticence about the fame thing seemed to me to be seductive and yet high hazard. So I didn't really need to be known. That was a fact. And so uh, I did a nom de guerre, a name of war. I did a, uh, an alias, George Washington Brown. I met him in Peru. Anyway, <laughs> I did a fictitious character, and we threw the record out to no one in particular. College ra FM radio stations at that time were just gaining their provenance. They didn't have any real power. 
There was very little promotion beyond the $20 bills in the brown bags that promotion men gave to program to AM directors. This was a different game. We were learning how a record could be promoted. Nice thing about uh, Donovan's Colors that George Washington Brown played, it ended up on a jukebox in Greenwich Village. And a man reviewed the record for a page of the Village Voice. He took a page to explain the phenomenon of this record called Donovan's Colors. Warner Brothers was then told by his article what they were thinking. And what they started to think was that I was an artist. So I got that great contract. They gave him the keys to the candy store, basically. It's like, what kind of budget do you want for this? You got it. I mean, anybody who meets Van Dyke is going to be impressed by the guy. Come on, I mean, then as now. You know, very articulate guy, mannerly, clearly not just some long-haired bell-bottom kid on the make. He was something very different, and people respond to that in a time where weird was good and weirder is better. You know, that period, the Halcyon period, where people like Don Van Vliet, Captain Beefheart, got record deals. So Van Dyke kind of flourished in this hothouse period where unusual Warner Brothers was this interesting terrarium where very unusual plants were allowed to grow and were nurtured. So, yeah, that's the start of Song Cycle. That's the Well, you'll notice that the song that starts the record is called Black Jack Davy. I consider it like the Tales of Br'er Rabbit as a Rosetta Stone of American musicological and folkloric value. This is a great piece of music. It's a ballad. It's Steve Young singing that song. That's how I started the damn record. Steve Young was a, a man of merit and deserving appreciation. And also I had a fealty to the folk idioms. That's why Black Jack Davy is there. A real piece of Americana. Something beyond my proprietary gain. And uh, this is the way I see the world. Van Dyke always valued Steve Young as an original American, like a really great, genuinely, couldn't come from any other country kind of talent, Steve Young. And Van Dyke and he kind of were making the same sort of pilgrim's progress, trying to get their feet on the ground in Los Angeles at the same time. In any case, very interesting guy, and Van Dyke sort of thought that his saga was worth chronicling. Then, Randy Newman wrote a song for me. I wanted to get make sure I got a song done. And Randy Newman, who had been uh, taking uh, odd jobs and like, my God, Peyton Place for TV. It's uh, just a, a, a privileged child of uh, Hollywood uh, aristocracy, the Newman family, and well-agented and very talented. So Randy knew that I lived on Vine Street he knew that I'd, I'd put out a record on MGM with Beethoven's beautiful Ninth Symphony Chorale, that theme. Vine Street. I sold a guitar today. I never could play much anyway.
By the way, he did a brilliant, a brilliant string arrangement. So graciously conducted by his Uncle Al, who would die in three months of emphysema. His Uncle Al, who did the 20th Century Fox theme. The strings are sultaste. They're very skinny. You'll notice they're very high. They're, so you hear mostly rosin. It's the absence of, of uh, notes. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? We used to live there on Vine Street. She made perfume in the back of the room. And me and my group would sit out in the stoop. And we'd play for her the song she liked best to have us play. On So he knew that my uh, my first wife, my squeeze, made perfume in the back of the room. He knew all that, and he threw this biographical wonder at my feet. I played guitar very well, actually. I was alive, but I went along with a gag, and I recorded that. On the What I had was coming up with was music of a essentially an acoustic focus, focus on real instruments playing together. That's what I wanted to do. And doing so, I wanted to make sure that everything was as demonstrable on by Palm Desert. I wanted to accentuate with timpani, and I got timpani. And believe me, I knew the $125 that went to Cartage for the timpani was not going into my rent. I knew that. A lot of other people were getting record contracts in the gold rush to Laurel Canyon from the Brill Building in, in New York. The musical center had shifted. But I didn't go and buy real estate and cars. I put my money into orchestras. And then it goes into, I came west onto Hollywood, and I thought because Nudies was making uh, clothes for people like Graham Parson and so forth, there were the grindstone cowboys all over the place, a whole bunch of people, uh, hippies pretending that they knew how to mount a horse and never got saddled. But for that reason, I wanted to really make sure I used all the archetypes available, and that's why the steel guitar is there. It was so fabulous for me. I was not the first to really love this steel guitar and pop. Pop music had employed it. It had crossed the aisle from, from country and rockabilly. But I remember Gary Lewis did something that he used a bunch of steel guitar. And that, that was probably the first time I'd heard it in pop music. And I thought that would be a great instrument to center Palm Desert. Have you been to Palm Desert? I mean, there's not a lot to write home about. I mean, now it's filled with corporate wellness retreats and crap like that. But at the time, I mean, you could go to be like Graham Parsons and fetishize Joshua Tree and just wander around the desert loaded. But with Van Dyke, it was just like getting away from distraction, you know, just 
being out there and doing that and getting a song out of it while he was there. But just, just him bent over a keyboard, working hard with staff paper, which has been his whole life. You know, whether he's film scoring or writing arrangements for someone else's record or working on his own material, he's very much almost a pencil and paper guy. But he is, at core, very much a hands-on, do-your-own-work musician. And I say that, do-your-own-work, because I exist in a forum where film composers are expected to have an army of little Grammys doing stuff for them. You know, like, oh, I'll come out with some, like, right-handed melody. My arranger will turn it into the cue. You know, I'll have these ghost writers doing the cues I don't have time to get to, stuff like that. But Van Dyke, very much that kind of do-your-own-work kind of guy, hard-working guy. So I was in Palm Springs. I came west onto Hollywood. I thought about income disparity. I thought about um, a sense of place. I wanted the record to have a sense of place. That's why I did that uh, stomp at uh, in, uh, Palm Desert. I wanted to have it be a, a luxurious moment in Southern California and with a definitely a, an informed optimism. By your leave, we'll stay The full orchestra really is his canvas. I mean, he can sit down in a club and play, and, you know, many people have seen him do that. I've seen him do it a number of times. He can sit down on a piano and have minimal accompaniment, string bassist and maybe one other person, and do a really engaging set. But having the full orchestra in the European understanding of that possibility, that's his canvas. That's really where he feels liberated and can take wing with music and, and do what he wants. Uh, whereas people are waiting for studio technology or waiting for this or waiting for that to make their thing happen. He doesn't really need that. And you get a sense of that in Song Cycle, despite all the wonderful coloration that Bruce Botnick's recording studio technique brings to the record, it's still a record that's very much composed and arranged in uh, almost you know, German way. I mean, it's it's amazing to that end. So it, it exists in both worlds. It exists in the world of, compos you know, old school composition. It exists in the world of newfangled, the recording studio as an instrument. And he was the first who could legitimately lay claim to that, you know, well before Brian Eno, who was always heralded for doing that. So it exists in both camps. That duality makes the record that much more interesting. I got to experience the joy of a discovery and uh, sometimes it went as expected, often, more often than not, entirely different. So Song Cycle proved that although I, took, I had five years of perfect attendance at Presbyterian Sunday School, but you wouldn't think I'm a Presbyterian after having heard that record. It has no idea how to presage, to understand what's coming next. It's deceptive because it is deceived. It was a tragic age for me. It was post-mortem. I was very much with my brother in his grave. It was brutal. I wasn't communicating anything to anybody. So what did I do? As they said in Lit 101, when I went to school, in Literature 101, they'd say, write what you know. So I wrote about the trauma of my recovery from my brother's death, which had just occurred in 63. I was recovering from that and the death of John Kennedy and all kinds of nonsense, Martin Luther King, and the list goes on. As in years of yore, the thought of you divided us. It just made you to discuss in contact in the willows or what. 
I really respected my aunt, my mother's sister, and she was uh, laden with cancer. So I decided to write a song for her. And you got to remember, this is all stuff is all being put on record at a time where people were breaking away from their families. The American nuclear family was considered an obsolescent item, and that California, especially, was filled with people that just took off from their families. Like, screw you, I'm going to live the way I want to, dress the way I want to. I'm not buying into this Eisenhower era package. And so families, family life, ancestry, not a big part of hip culture at all. People really divorced themselves from their families at that point in time. Many people never reconnected with their families. They joined Harry Krishna and disappeared. They did a lot of weird things back then. And so here's this guy who is speaking a form of English that takes a lot of education to get to. He was very articulate, very well-educated guy whose family mattered to him. And he realized the kind of illustrious, one-of-a-kind aspects of his family. His father led a dance band, which also figures into the lyrics of Song Cycle. And the, his brothers, and I mean, the fact that he could play piano when he could barely stand. And they had more than one piano in the house, so they'd play duets him and his other family members. You know, family and what came before him was very important to him, and that was something that was not on the table for a lot of people in hip culture in the late 60s. But he was just, you know, your own family, that was something you got away from. And here is Van Dyke kind of delving into this and uh, celebrating. It was a very interesting take on things. You we all suspect the mortal door Future. Factories face the poor. Factories face the poor. Income disparity. Yeah, put that in songs. I do. I think about it all the time. I know so many poor people. I only regret that I don't have more to give. That's my only problem on that. I want you to know that I'm grateful for every opportunity I had to explore these. These, They weren't whims. They were psychological survival tools for me at the time. I was a poor boy. I rented. I still have no savings account. I'm 79 and I'm a musician and quite happy in my work. It's evolution. Van Dyke was somebody who inhabited the past as much as he did the present. And as such, created something that was kind of futuristic sounding. So he took terms that at one point in history, everybody knew what they meant. And, you know, culture had just motored on past those terms. And they didn't have meaning for most people anymore. Unless you were a New Englander and owned a certain kind of house near the water, you wouldn't know what a widow's walk was. But again, he's taking an architectural colloquialism and then making it literal, talking about widows walking, an extra dimension to the words he's presenting. Contented is the boat by chance, how forlorn the shore. I've meant to take the chance. My relationships with Warner Brothers were very problematic. I felt it was insultory. I knew because when Jack Holzman, the head of Electra, came to my house in Laurel Canyon with Judy Collins to ask me what I was doing, and I played them song cycle. He went to Mo Austin, he said, why isn't this out? And Mo said, oh, we, you know, he said, he said, if you don't want to release it, I sure do, please. I would have had an easier life uh, with the New York 
than in this cow town. I would have. It would have been okay. People weren't so concerned about fucking with the formula. It would have been easier. But my fun meter, I'm telling you the truth. It's on 10. I think that that is an elegant record. <laughs> I like the fact that Song Cycle successfully uh, reveals an ambience, uh, a refuge, an album can offer. Sometimes it has an expositionary feel. Sometimes it doesn't go anywhere. But um, I was happy with it. I was happy with the All Golden. Nothing innovative, but a very good diaphanous way of entering it. On which there was a capstan in the tape machine that was going 15 IPS. There was a capstan through which the tape travels. And I decided on the repeat of the harp to wrap the capstan irregularly. Boing, doing, doing. You know, so you hear the laughs. And that, and, and that would catch. Now, all of this sounds totally loony, but if you think that I'm crazy, try Stockhausen or go to Esquivel in Mexico, just here, or Bob Thompson, who did many arrangements for me in my later career, to learn how many musicians shamelessly wanted to explore these potentials. They might eventually come to mean something. The Fargo is one of those ideas that a few people unknown to one another had at the same time, or roughly the same time. But mostly the invention of either Doug Bodnick or Bruce Bodnick, depending on who you talk to, the two brothers, both engineers, Bruce also having a much more extensive career in record production, having worked with The Doors and Arthur Lee and Love and people like that. Um, but it's like origami. It's a little paper ring that you fold and fold and fold and fold and tape together, and you put it around a tape capstan, the little pinch roller and the rubber roller, the little spinning metal dowel and the rubber roller that's opposite it with the tape in between, and those things connect, and they make the tape go forward. Well, if you put this little farkle thing, this, this little origami ring, around the pinch roller, it causes the tape to wobble like this. Now you can just do it with a plug-in. But at the time, this was very much this sort of mechanical approach. Bruce Botnick has mentioned Farkle. He made up that word when I told him, let's wrap the capstan. Bruce did my record. This is, <laughs> as his career was unfolding, he had just, I think, I think that he had just done the doors. I always liked Bruce Botnick's credit on the record, stereo compositions, instead of just like recorded and mixed by, stereo compositions. And a great example of Van Dyke's verbal specificity and how he could, with a very few words, open up a whole other realm of consideration for a particular job someone had done on his behalf. Very nice. Off the record, he is hungry. 
country, though he works hard in his Alabama country fair. Well, you know, it's the Horatio Alger story in a way. Someone went west to like reinvent their lives and turn it around for themselves. And uh, it's very much the admiring portrait of uh, Van Dyke's depiction of Steve Young and his uh, travails and adventures in getting from where he came from to California and then trying to uh, make a living for himself. But Van Dyke just recognized this, as I said before, this kind of quintessentially American aspect of him. Steve Young was a guy who was, uh, he, Waylon Jennings wanted to be Steve Young. He was a charismatic Ara Alabaman, and he had a, a picture of George C. Wallace, who was a racist pig, on his wall that had a Hitlerian mustache. And I knew that Steve was a man that, uh, just as perplexed as I was, about having been born in the South. It was not hip in the... Uh, foment of all the race riots and the hoses and the dogs and the, and the hangings and the, oh my God. The songwriting form wasn't yet understood by me as a political force that it has become. Bob Dylan came out in 63, remember that? Beach Boys came out in 63. Rolling Stones came out in 63, remember that? I do, I was here. I remember when the Brits came over and co-opted our linguistics. I'm from Mississippi. I know what the blues are. I've heard them. This was uh, so faux, fab faux music. Blues from Britain was something of uh, an irony to me. And it became pocked by the reality that very few black musicians have an opportunity to play the blues in the house of blues today. That's what happened with the branding of the blues. White kids got the woo-woos and took it over. So I avoided the blues. I've stayed cheerful all the time. This is Van Dyke very much conscious of, you know, English interlopers coming in and knocking us all out of business with everything after Beatlemania that, uh, and then the, you know, amplified blues music that was coming out of England in the later 60s and things like that. You know, he was all about being American. So that was, Steve Young was kind of the representative of all that stuff for Van Dyke's way of thinking. He returned from Alabama to see what he could see. And the All Golden, a fantastic tribute to him. It's one of the songs from Song Cycle that Van Dyke regularly included in his concert repertoire. I seem to recall hearing an a cappella version of it at one point, which, given how dressed up that song is on record, both with the arrangements and the, the mixing treatment of it by Bruce Botnick, it's just a song that is its own little world within those few minutes. And... Uh, uh, a great piece of writing on Van Dyke's part. The sinking of the Titanic, to me, was a great archetype. It shows the feckless folly of all human endeavor. It, I wanted to treat it with sobriety and sincerity because this was one of the big blows to me. This, is, was, this was such an astonishing brutality to me when I heard about the Titanic when I was a kid. That was as big as how they shot the Russian family 
in Russia, the Tsar and his children. Man, I just couldn't understand are the Jews in Dachau. I was deadly serious about this putting the Titanic in there and showing and celebrating that aspect of uh, my own experience. But um, I had heard somewhere along the line from, I think, the songwriter Jim Ford, happy songs sell records, sad songs sell beer. Well, you know, I didn't have that wisdom when I did Song Cycle. I only had to do what I knew. I had to do what Lit 101 told me. I had to accept the fact that it would eventually be a self-reckoning in a way. That's why there is a Mexican ostinato here. This record to me is as much a musical reference guide as the uh, Howard Zinn's uh, American Encyclopedia. And I really think it's got that capacity to question and also it shows great inability but it shows great desire. And that desire is to serve and to be useful to other people, and to entertain. Like Phil Oakes said, my good friend Phil Oakes said, in such ugly times, beauty is the only true protest. So rally round a wild Jim Crow, for I thought I'd like to show they can recall the Alamo way down in old Mexico. He kind of like flipped the thing where public domain was credited to Van Dyke Parks, Van Dyke Parks was credited to public domain. It was it was just this funny little mind game he was playing at the time. There's no underestimating the significance of mind games at that point in time. I mean, people, especially if they had anything like an education as Van Dyke did, but were also into better living through chemistry, the, the whole mind game aspect and let's play these little Joycean games with words and what we can do. Public domain, very much a part of that. Again, uh, Farkle implementation there on the harp. And again, this construction of a landscape you know, you can hear the wind through the telephone wires on that one. You know, it's just, it's a very much an environmental piece, as most of the pieces on the record are. They, again, bring up Brian Eno, somebody who has cited Song Cycle as a favorite thing. And actually, in one of his interviews, Eno defined uh, Song Cycle as a record that only other musicians bought. He was, he was very good at summarizing that. He was the source, of course, of that quote about the Velvet Underground. You know, their first record sold 20,000 copies. Every one of those people started a band. Well, for Song Cycle, he's brought that up in interviews, too, saying, you know, only other musicians could get that record. That's a record that musicians buy and that regular folks with stereos don't. If you're going to go out there and be bare naked, you know, it's like on, on, on a bucking bronco, you're revealing yourself. You might as well explore these components of personality. And I thought that was important to do. Now, of course... It was very short-sighted of me. I forgot that people might listen to this record. But I'm telling you the truth as we speak. That was beyond my comprehension. I could not imagine that anybody was going to listen to this.
I did variations on the simple tune, a do re mi tune called Colors. And I did whatever I could. I went, That was a good clarinet part. And it was just a, a little bijou. It was a tribute to Donovan. I felt so sorry for him because everyone said he was a wannabe Bob Dylan. I felt sorry for the guy. I've always loved the underdog. It was a beautiful tune. Why not do it? So I did it. And I thought it was wonderful. When I did Donovan's Colors, you will hear a, a marimba. It's called um, Reiterated Tremlando. Okay? Marimba. I can't play marimba that well, but I had to. So I recorded the marimba at seven and a half inches per second and then played it back normally at 15 IPS. It achieved an octave. Now, nobody told me Pythagoras wasn't alive, and I'm no mathematician, but nobody told me that doubling the tape speed would create an octave differential. And isn't that great? Donovan's Colors, we were on three-track tape, by the way, sir. Three-track. And you could not bounce an adjacent track. So we went quickly from three to four-track. This is while Brian Wilson's got uh, two eight-tracks up in his home, up in the uh, Hollywood Hills, Beverly Hills, actually. So we went to four-track. We bounced three to four. Started with the piano. Then I concocted this somewhat of an orchestrion I intended. It reminded me of an orchestrion, the ancient Dutch instruments that played band music and so forth, and you'd find them in saloons in the United States in the Old West. I don't get reactions to songs like, oh, people want to avoid it, or, you know. One time Ry Cooter gave me a CD, he said, please take this, people are turning it down, you know. They, nobody wants a CD, it's true, nobody wants nothing, they don't want to hear it. We've lost the capacity, you know, it's like the shuffle mentality has put us on a kind of like a, a very fast referential schedule. But I don't think people would want to embarrass me or themselves by concluding anything about the work. But I get a sense that it has been a buoyant utility for many people who have been depressed because it seems like if this isn't informed optimism, I don't know what is. Came to fair, some thought.
thoughts in the past. I made a dash out of him in the weather. And then I came to see in baggage the memories of drunken souvenirs. The war years high. I said hi. Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns both told me that they worked to my to song cycle. They painted to song cycle. Art Spiegelman, famous for his mouse epic, told me I saved his life. I mean, the song cycle did. I can't fathom the degree of proprietary interpretation people would take of, over the abstractions of the work, but I'm, I'm delighted that that could happen. That's important to me. It's important to me that I know that I'm, I'm no poseur. I can't tell people what to think. I wouldn't do that. But um, in Song Cycle, when you listen to it, you can tell the kid is stumbling around. There's in the attic, looking through his father's war letters. What a psychologically damaged boy. He must come from a dysfunctional family or something. The state hasn't helped him to carry on. The attic is just this kind of the sweet and sour of memory and remembering more than you want to remember uh, and how painful that can be. It's kind of an evaluation of nostalgia and uh, a denial of nostalgia. Very interesting song. At one point with this record, because I just lived inside this record for a long time in the way I've lived inside a few others, but at one point I decided to let go of decoding things and to let him live beyond interpretation. And I think, in a way, Van Dyke's lyrical content speaks to his own eloquence, it speaks to the way his mind works, uh, it speaks to his experience, certainly, and the experiences of those around him, people like Steve Young, for instance. But... Ultimately, I think to pay him the best compliment would be to allow Van Dyke to live beyond interpretation. Cracks in the heat and then caught by the wind Cats the country store feel for the hackamore crew View the cracker bear coteries and by Certainly Laurel Canyon was a big thing, but not big enough that he couldn't make fun of it. The seat of the bee to meet, and I mean all that stuff, to lampoon it a little bit and think it was a little bit too rank and file for him. I mean he's always going to be an outsider. But... You know, Van Dyke's very, always very aware of who's doing what, and he knew that he was there at a special point in history, the format of the whole singer-songwriter thing, which he was in at the get-go of, and the fact that Laurel Canyon was the place to be. People getting signed to big record deals who before were living out of a garage, and, and you know, like, people who, because they had the right hair and dressed well, could get deals. I mean, you know, you know this is a balloon, people... We've had gold rushes before. It never turns out well. Okay, something's going to go up. It's going to come down. I always loved the little like slow tape effect they did on that. The down. Yeah. <laughs> 
needs and eats of the heart of their companion way that up Carl Canyon. What up the canyon will even eventually come down. The violin, Misha Gudachev, the violinist Misha Gudachev, played at the Balalaika restaurant on Melrose. It's gone, right next to Paramount Studios. It was in there that the violinist almost stabbed my mother in the eye when she came to visit me, when I took her to a Russian restaurant. A poor immigrant who had nothing else to declare about his opportunity, show business opportunities in LA. How about it? I insisted that he... <laughs> I'm one of those, some kind of a uh, diminished flourish or something. There is a, uh, uh, on this album, I believe, there is a sense of confirmation to try to confirm people you know, yes, I think that that's very important. I, even like, say, in this, in a present age, in this era of multiculturalism, and you'll note in Song Cycle, I was thinking about it. That's why I had a balalaika orchestra with five people. Have you ever seen a bass balalaika? Incredible. It's like a huge triangle. It's bigger than a cello. Oh, man. And I had five of those Russians from whence they sprang, had sprang, I don't know. Balalaika players on the record. And that was, again, one of those situations where it's like, okay, let's find how many bars are empty in this little stretch of the multi-track tape so we can plug in the Balalaika player and get out before we erase the thing that we've already got on the tape that's coming up next. I cannot emphasize the riskiness of doing that kind of thing. That was the kind of odds they were up against doing Song Cycle, trying to fit extra parts in. Because Van Dyke was very much a creature of the moment. Spontaneous thought, that was his engine. And uh, to to be able to, oh, I, I found this balalaika player in a restaurant. we got to have him on. we got to have him on this song. And figuring out the little spaces. And they would sometimes jump from track to track to track, just have a continuous part running through the record. But they were out of tape real estate to do anything with. So they have to find these little empty bars, dead bars for the different players to slot in the guy here, there, there. I would not have wanted to be in charge of that. That's like such a high wire act. I was interested in multiculturalism. I am today, and I think if you want to, if you want to cross the aisle, and we must try either the food or the language. I'm on the food right now. When I go to a Korean restaurant, this is a way to learn. The arts will help, but we have this multiculturalism, and and you can sense that I was in going in that direction on Song Cycle. That was before I exposed my ambivalence about Russia because my brother had been in, in the State Department and died there in the Cold War, and I feared Russia. And I'm very sorry that Russia has turned out to be the very beast that those right-wing xenophobic Republicans in the 50s thought it was.
at the time by the people. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a fresh wound where we were caught in a strategic embarrassment and at risk in a nuclear age. I had come from a childhood of duck, you know, under the desk when you're told because of the nuclear. People were building bomb shelters. So Russia was my armada. That's what I thought of it. I was worried. There might be some basic problem of under, misunderstanding. That's why I thought about the czar. I just want to use that word. I've always feared the czars, whether the in record business or anything else. I mean, I learned about Russian brutality to some degree. I had no idea it was this malignant. It's just very sad. And, and for all I knew, my brother was offed by a Ruski, for all I know. All I know is I had to put his body in the ground and Dean Russ got his body flown to us so that we could put him in the ground. And I'm telling you, this was a compacted caricature of my prejudices about Russia. And I didn't care if it belched. Uh, uh, I just remember. <laughs> I remember there were moments of Um, I wanted it to sound Slavic. The Beatles hadn't just had not done back in the USSR. It was squatters' rights. I just wanted to do this thing that illustrated the reality of Russia in the Cold War, for Pete's sake. And I wasn't writing rhinestone cowboy songs, and I didn't care who got laid in the back seat of the truck. I was writing different kinds of songs. Joe Smith, the president of the company, came in, heard it through, and said, Song Cycle, hmm, I don't hear the song. And, you know, you think you're going to get a good vibrations out of this, or you're going to get something else. And it's just not like that. It's a different kind of record. And, it, and in a way, it paved the way for a lot of records to come. And it was certainly the beginning of that whole thing of like critics' favorites. Favorites that the rock critics that got the records for free loved the records. And the people who had to buy the records didn't know what to make of it. Hence this hideous discrepancy between what the record cost to make and the, and the enormity of the intent behind the record and invention behind the record versus this paltry commercial response. I can't tell you what what a great practicality song cycle turned out for me and economically for Warner Brothers in spite of their insultory publicity. Well, Stan Cornyn, a real character, he kind of came out of that Playboy magazine, Esquire magazine of the 60s, shag rug culture. He was one of those guys. He was like a madman. And so he cooked up this idea, he cooked up this campaign based on the fact that it cost a lot of money to make this record, as much money, I think, as any album had been budgeted to that point in history, aside from maybe Brian Wilson's Good Vibration Sessions, you know, like that much money to make a single. So, you know, a lot of money spent on this record by someone who no one knew. And so he kind of started just being very literal about, okay, here's how much we still have to recoup on this record in big bold Helvetica type across the top of the ad with a picture of Van Dyke from the cover and, and like, yeah, it's looking dark for the song cycle and, you know, all this other stuff, kind of making light of how dism what a dismal commercial performance this record had um, done to date. So 
Van Dyke actually chased Cornyn down in the hallway at Warner's, you know, wanting to know if he wanted, was trying to destroy his career. You know, like, oh, here's how badly my record's done. Now the record company's making fun of it. At Warner Brothers, I've been around a lot of heroes and a lot of villains. And I was just glad that they could write me off as a deduction. The U.S. citizens paid for that effort. And then, of course, they charged me the same amount, which was 32000 bucks. They took it up to 37 because they made a, an album cover that was not acceptable to me. They made an album cover they were going to throw at me called You Are Now Entering Van Dyke Parks. And I said to them through my attorney, no, they're not entering Van Dyke Parks. It's not going to happen to me. They're not going to do that. Wasn't that glib? So I had to have the artwork changed. That was the first time the art department had been contested. Then here comes Randy Newman. Randy Newman, I get a call because co-produced Randy Newman with Lenny Warrenker, his first album. And uh, I get a call from I.G. Newman, Irving G. Newman, my doctor, my doctor, my diagnostician, Randy's father, said, uh, get that fucking album uh, reprinted. Get that fucking thing reprinted. What are you doing to my son? You're referring to my son as that pudgy hoagie Carmichael? That Nazi bastard? Get his name off my son's record. Yeah, the doctor called me, so I had to turn down the art department once again. And I generally left that industry having served as a bureaucrat. I couldn't take it. I did it to get back to work and enjoy the epiphany moments that I found in, in Song Cycle. To write up the band from the happy and other boy of your soul. The song, the forgotten south, just don't hang us up. Here, 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 here. unknown as it has. And not far from my heel, the tar baby feel for the czar. For those who are lonely, well, the black sea is calling your star in the storm, and so y'all got to be. We know when you do the earth, it is very to show, to say we all had to go. The hasten to jar the few nations to our gods. That record went through, this shows you how quickly technology was changing at that point in time. And so he started on 4-track, went to 8-track, wound up on 16-track, but... 16 track, I think, came in right at the end of that. And the kind of postscript track at the end of the record, which is just Van Dyke playing piano and singing by himself. It's the simplest thing in the record. And that just occupied, they got 16 track to use. He used two tracks of the 16 track to do that. So that's kind of funny. Uh, but yeah, just Van Dyke. And he, and he described it as he wanted to seem like someone in the far corner of a room by a window playing piano. And so it has this sort of distant, roomy feel to it. He described the setting for it, how he wanted someone in their mind listening to the record to picture someone sitting by a window with a piano, watching somebody outside, watching this gardener, who I met later. Gardener worked with Van Dyke forever. I studied the Japanese gardener. They're gone. They're gone. There are no more Japanese gardeners. It's all mow and blow, and it's Latino. It's all the big gasoline machines. It's the noise brigade. You can't think. I'd like to re-release uh, Song Cycle. However, there are just two components that I'm still looking for. Warner's archives can't find potpourri and um, Van Dyke Parks, the sinking of the Titanic. They can't find two components of the piece. That shows a problem in, in uh, archiving. So as we speak, or as I am heard, this thing called Song Cycle has been in large part erased. We are 
many of us of that era are being erased because we don't migrate to new formats or in the absence of a format, a platform. I was disappointed in many ways with Song Cycle because I didn't get what I wanted, but I got what I deserved. And finally, because I, it became a utility for me. And I then went on to serve other people. And I think if you listen to Song Cycle, if you're tolerant enough, and if you've ever seen a Rauschenberg, I had one hanging on the wall, but you see this pastiche, a collage, as it were, was big, it was fashionable, and it is, to me, pop art. I really think it's got the pop art. He describes himself at the time as a pop artist. He didn't think what he was doing was so different than what Andy Warhol was doing with soup cans or what uh, Roy Lichtenstein was doing with comic book bende dots. He was a pop artist, and he was reflecting a lot of things in culture, especially in his local culture, you know, the culture that prized... Laurel Canyon is this sort of hotbed of creativity and the place to be. And, you know, he took note of all these things and, um, and included them in his, it was all grist for his mill. In some ways, listening to song cycle is like twirling the dial on a radio and having it come out musical instead of just Dadaist ecstatic. You know, it's like, here comes a pedal steel, here comes a synthesizer, here comes this, here comes that. I think it is a very a desperately, fiercely optimistic record. And... The legacy, I think, is basically its influence on the technology that informed it. I think people learned how to do stuff by my having learned how to do stuff. Well, Song Cycle is a very American record. It's a very forward-thinking record, but it's got one foot firmly anchored in the past. Song Cycle represents the confluence of resources and talent and a bull economy in the country at a time when those things met in a way that they probably wouldn't meet ever again. But he made something new under the sun. And that's a big reason why I still love this record, why, you know, people like Joanna Newsom grab him to work with them, you know, because it has enduring value. But the thing is, I think that everybody senses that whether it would be Grizzly Bear or my beloved, I love that guy from the Fleet Foxes, Robin, some of these indie groups that say they have been influenced by my work or were aware of it. I think that they understand we have an urgency which is not cute to mute. And we need to stay involved in our work and agitate the sensibilities through some way and I do that in the best way I can. We found out things about the studio and song cycle I think was was a positive instrument even for those who detested its oblivion or pretense or one person I remember isn't it funny you can't forget it one person called it the Edsel of pop music so this is what I speak of when I speak of the authority of failure I have received that crow tastes fine I've received that my joy has been in doing it Visit lifeoftherecord.com for more information about Van Dyke Parks. You'll also find a full transcript of this episode and a link to purchase Song Cycle. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.